let's say you're a Unity developer and purely hypothetically speaking, maybe there's been recent events that make you think, hey, maybe I want to switch to a different engine, right? Could be. And maybe that engine is Unreal Engine and you're looking for a place to see what the most basic and important differences are. Well, that's what I'm here for. I've worked with both Unity a bit and a bit with Unreal and I think I can help you bridge the gap at least to get started with. So, okay, first and foremost, we have something that is going to throw you for a loop uh, for a while, probably, and that is the directions in both engines. You see, in Unreal, we have an X, Y, and Z direction, as any engine does, uh, but in Unity, you might be used to the Y axis being the up and down. The flat plane for the ground will be the X and Z axis. In Unreal, and actually in most other 3D software, it's the Z axis that is the up and down. So you can see here, when I change the Z axis, I move up and down, and when I change the Y axis, I move side to side. Now, I don't have a definitive answer as to why this is, but I strongly suspect that it has to do with Unity being more aimed towards having 2D capabilities. Unreal also theoretically has them, but it's definitely not built for it. So when you're making a 2D game in Unity, of course what you want is you want to have an X and a Y axis, and you can just ignore the Z axis. The Z axis will be the depth, and in a 2D game, most of the time, you're not going to bother with that depth. So that makes a situation where we have an X axis like this, and a Y axis like this, and that makes the Y axis the up and down axis. When 3D is our primary goal for a game to make, it makes sense to have the X and the Y axis form the ground plane, and then the Z axis, instead of being the depth, it being the height. Again, if you go into a program like Blender, you'll also see that the Z axis is the up and down there. It's actually pretty standard for anything that is primarily 3D. On the other hand, going into a program like Adobe After Effects, which has 3D capabilities, but definitely is a 2D program, you see something similar that you see in Unity. You have an X and a Y axis for the left, right, and up and down. And then when you add a third axis to that, that is depth, and that becomes the Z axis. So that is most likely, at least my theory, why these axes are different between the engines. It's something that you do need to get used to when going from one engine to the other. I'm going to talk about the way scripting works or programming works in both of these engines and the structure and the framework that is done within. So let's get started with that. Let's say in Unity here, we uh, make a capsule, for instance, let's say that this is our test player, and we want to add a component to it, uh, we can add our own script for the time being, I'm not going to do that because I don't know if I have an IDE set up for Unity, I probably do, but let's instead uh, simply add a rigid body to this, right? Now, if we want to save this configuration of components, you're used to doing this, you can just drag it into your project folder here and it makes a prefab. This prefab, in essence, is nothing more than saying, hey, these things all go together with these specific values to make this game object. And that's fine. But if you're going into Unreal, you might have heard that blueprints are kind of like what a prefab does. And essentially, that is kind of only half correct. So let's go over to Unreal real quick. I have Unreal open here as well and this is my own game, I have a Blueprint class here. And you might hear me saying Blueprint class, and that is actually an important distinction. So let's open this up, and we can see here on the left-hand side that indeed it does have a whole bunch of components. And if I go, for instance, to my Healing Particles component, it does have preset values. And I can very much just drag this actor they're called actors, not game objects in Unreal, uh, into the world, and that will work fine. So how exactly is it different from a prefab? That sounds pretty damn similar to a prefab, and that's because it is. But there's one important difference. You might have caught me saying it before. This is a class. This is not just a collection of different scripts. This is a class in and of itself, meaning that aside from it housing your components that you might have, it can also hold code 
in and of itself without any of this. So I could make a second blueprint class with all these exact same components with the exact same values, but the code on the class itself could be entirely different. And depending on your point of view, that can be either very messy or very, very powerful. So if you're working with blueprints in this project, I'm working with both. So this blueprint uh, graph has a couple of events here. All of the stuff that I am programming in here and everything that's in the C++ class uh, related to this, which is like quite a lot of code at this point. Let's see, I think it's about a thousand lines almost, 800 something. Um, that does need to be cleaned up. It's going to be less probably in a bit. That's all related to, uh, well, that C++ class and this blueprint class, which is related to each other. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the relation between C++ and Blueprint in this video, because that's not what this video is for. If you want that, go follow my C++ course for Unreal. And if you want to follow that, I do recommend you first go through the Unreal Basics course that I also have on this channel. Today, we're just talking about the likenesses and the differences between Unreal and Unity, though. So this you can't really do in Unity. What you would do in Unity is this would just be yet another component that you put on your game object, which is a perfectly fine way of working. But let's talk a little bit more about actors, because you heard me call uh, this thing an actor before, uh, and not a game object, and that is because that's the verbiage Unreal uses. But if I make a new blueprint class here, for instance, I need to choose a parent class. So whenever I make a new class, whether that be a blueprint, or a C++ class, whether that be a actor or a component, because you can still make components, of course. You, you can see them here, actor components and scene components. An actor component is pretty much what you're used to in Unity with mono behavior. It's just something that you can put onto an actor that houses information and functionality. And a scene component is the same thing, but it also has a transform to it. So it has a physical location in the world. Now, the thing I want to talk about is these five things up here. These are the things that make Unreal into Unreal. Starting with actors. Anything that you've put into the world, so anything that you see here in my levels, is classified as an actor. And the actor is a class that just has a bunch of very, very useful quality of life code for you to be able to use. In essence, it is the same as the game object, like just the base thing that everything comes back to, right? But then we have the pawn and the character, which are children of the actor, meaning that anything that the actor can do, the pawn can also do. And anything that the pawn can do, the character also can do. But they add their own functionality on top. And for the character, that is just something uh, like having a pre-made character movement component and a, a pre-made capsule collision and a, and a skeletal mesh, which you can animate. The thing I want to talk about right now is the thing that is added in the pawn, and that is the ability to possess something. And possessing a pawn just means that a different actor, that being a controller actor, you see player control here, we're working towards that, I can give it instructions and then the pawn can do something with those instructions. Now, the wonderful thing about that being is we can make a pawn, and I'm going to go into a different project here and actually show you a, a more understandable explanation of this. I have a project here, which is more C++ based, uh, because this is the project that I'm doing uh, in my C++ course. And there we have uh, my base magic character. This is the header file, uh, this is the C++ file, the implementation file. And this pawn has a function to shoot a bullet. And that is a function that will need to exist on both the player and the enemies. I can just have this pawn and both my players and my enemies can be this type of pawn because it has all the functionality that both of them need. The difference comes in with their controllers. Going back here, if I uh, type in controller, we can see we have the controller class, which has two children, the AI controller and the player controller. I think it's pretty self-explanatory what the difference is, right? The player controller will deal with your player input. So anything you put through the player controller, you can then use to influence 
the thing that you're possessing as the player and the same thing with an air controller that can just give instructions to whatever pawn it is possessing and the wonderful thing about all this and that's what we're working towards right is that that specific code can be on these controllers but both of these types of controllers can possess any pawn so i have a bp player uh which is blueprints is bp uh right here and i could drag this in and then give this one a player controller meaning that i can control it and everything will work just as a player just like you would expect and without needing to make a separate blueprint a separate prefab if you will i can just say this one is getting possessed by an ai controller and the functionality will be exactly the same everything about the code for the pawn will be exactly the same because the exact same class but it's now being driven through an ai and here we get into some potentially interesting stuff it's a very niche example but it's an example that i do like to use a lot let's say you want to make a mario odyssey type mechanic that's really easy due to this controller system that unreal has for you because if this is our player character and we for instance shoot a special magic capturing bullet to an enemy and we hit we can just simply say in our player controller hey whatever we just hit we're going to possess that instead and it's as easy as that now we're possessing this one and we can continue playing as this character all that said in this project here this is the uh, class for my player controller and you can see i have all of my uh, inputs set up through the player controller here and that is the way the engine expects you to do it but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do it that way right because this is my own game again it's a very very long class and i have the um action rpg character this is not a controller this is just a character class itself and in this case i have all of my input bindings set up on the character itself in a lot of situations that is hardly ideal for my game it doesn't really matter and i like having it in here so you can still do that you can just ignore the player controller altogether if you want to for the most part which brings us to uh, the next thing that I want to highlight, and that is we make a new blueprint class in common. We also have the game mode. And you're probably used to something very similar in this in Unity as well. Because if you're making a Unity game, there's a good chance that you have an empty game object somewhere in your world, which only holds a bunch of scripts that have to do with managing other game objects. Like a character manager for instance, or a score manager, or a color of the sky manager. I don't know what kind of managers you're making for your game. There's a good chance if you're making a Unity game, you have a game object that's just stacked with a lot of manager scripts. That's pretty much what a game mode is. For this project, uh, I'm still working on recording and releasing the C++ course, so we haven't made a game mode here yet. I'm going to go back to my own game here and i do have uh, a game mode for this and here you can see a couple of examples of things that you would recognize you might usually do in one of those manager scripts uh, when a enemy or even the player when anything dies uh, instead of destroying themselves they talk to the game mode and tell the game mode hey i'm gonna die now okay and then the game mode is the thing that destroys that actor and if they also pass in a float value, it will instead run this version of the function, which will then also uh, drop an experience orb with that value of experience and then destroy the actor. The wonderful thing about that is that it still keeps like the modularity of working with components to a certain extent. Because if I only let the XP drops um, spawn in when an enemy dies, and at some point in the future, I'm like, oh, but I want to have a destructible wall that drops an XP orb when you destroy it, for instance. That would then suddenly need to be a enemy, or it would need to have the same code that the enemy does on death. And that is all very clunky. Instead, we can just say this is one of the rules of the game. Actors, when they die, have a possibility of dropping experience. So we put it in the game mode. Any and all actors can access the game mode and anything that is within it at the same time it also uh, manages the battle music so we have this will just run every frame and when there is a certain ball that is being in battle or not which is driven through another place in the code somewhere else 
uh, it will choose between playing a battle music track and a non-battle music, just a relaxed music track. Now, this is a very rough placeholder version of this function. I'm going to <laughs> do a lot more work on this, but this is the kind of thing that you do in the game mode. Uh, I also used to have uh, setting the player location at the start of a level, but I have reworked that, so I really should uh, <laughs> remove that. And I have a function here for enemies. Uh, when the first boss is defeated, uh, I want to multiply all the enemy strength and HP by like 50%, right? So I set one variable on the game mode to 1.5, and then anytime an enemy spawns in, what it does is it looks at the game mode, and it sees, hey, should I add something to my multiplier? Should I multiply my HP or my strength by a certain amount? It's not quite how the system works, but that's something that the game mode remembers, and any actor can ask this information of the game mode when it needs to know about that. And for showing uh, why this is useful, I'm going to go back into the other project real quick, uh, just because I'm going to open up this uh, player blueprint. Because the reason that that is very useful is because every actor can use the get game mode function. This is just a simple node that returns the game mode of the level that you're currently in. You can have different game modes for different levels. So if you have a team deathmatch in your game, that would be one game mode. And for instance, when a player dies in that, it gives score points to the player that got the kill. But maybe you also have a capture the flag where you don't want to do that. Or maybe you want to have a last man standing game mode where you don't want anything to respawn at all. All these different rules for how the game should play out, you usually put them in the game mode. And there the player doesn't need to know everything that can happen in any given game mode. It just says, hey, I know that my HP just reached zero. That means that I'm supposed to die. I'm just going to tell the game mode, hey, I just died. You figure out what that actually means in this context. That is generally one of the more useful things that something like the game mode can do for you. And you can very easily access it. And it makes programming a lot of systems very, very easy. Now, there's about a million other different little things that I could be talking about here, about how Unity differs from Unreal. The different particle systems, the different material editors, and so on and so forth. This video would be about 20 hours long if I wanted to give a comprehensive overview. I just wanted to show you here the most important likenesses and differences and where both of those things lie. Specifically from a scripting and programming perspective. But I hope that through this video I've at least shown you the beginnings of roughly how those things translate. And I do believe that if you're reasonably confident in your abilities in Unity, picking up Unreal isn't going to be starting from zero. There's going to be a time of converting. There's going to be a time of getting used to all the new stuff. But if it took you 10 years to master Unity, it's not going to take you another 10 years to master Unreal. And hey, I am always happy to help. So I do have a series specifically about the basics of Unreal, all the things that you really need to know. And a lot of those if you're a Unity veteran, you're going to find yourself thinking, hey, I already kind of know about this, and that's kind of my point. And aside from that, I do also have that C++ course that is uh, coming out as I upload this. It's still in the works, but the first few parts should be out already. So you can check out both of those series. There's like 20, 30, eventually maybe 40 or so videos uh, that can help you through getting started in Unreal. So hopefully all that will help you out. I'm personally going to get back to uh, actually working on my game like I should be. And a very big thank you to all of my Patreons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thanks to my Cave Digger tier Patreons, Sergey Thomas, 